Hello, and good morning to everyone. My name is Rachel Schwaller. Uh, I have the honor to moderate the second panel today. Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of Kansas in the History Department and in the Religious Studies Department. My work centers around how uh, white evangelicals utilize scripture and devotional literature to scripturalize or naturalize free market economics. Um, and especially the way that these embedded colonial perspectives are placed on black and indigenous bodies and ways of being. I am um, not published yet, um, but I'll also be at the AAR this, uh, this coming November. So uh, while we were fortunate enough uh, yesterday to hear from Dr. Velma Love, uh, who's been with uh, the Institute for Signifying Scriptures for over 20 years, in me, um, you're introduced to one of its younger members. Um, I read Dr. Wimbush's introduction to theorizing scriptures when I was in my first year of graduate school, and I had never read anything like it before. It completely changed my project and my ideas, and in a sort of Pauline fashion, um, as I read that introduction, I felt uh, scales fall from my eyes. But it took... Um, it took two, two, uh, two babies, um, uh, a PhD, and eight years uh, before I actually emailed Dr. Wimbush um, to tell him any of this. Um, and I wasn't able to attend the ISS um, at any point uh, during that time uh, because of family obligations. The ISS conference always falls during my son's birthday. But anyway, last year I was able to attend um, virtually and to begin my journey in reaching out to people in this intellectual community. And so I was um, deeply gratified when Dr. Wimbush asked me to be the moderator uh, for this incredible panel. My own knowledge and research uh, by no means reaches the level of the august scholars who are on these panels. Um, and uh, in many ways, I feel like I am <laughs> doing the masquerade by, by being here. Um, but I, I am so pleased uh, that we can be together to encounter the ludic, uh, the horror, and the spectacle. So yesterday saw a provocative and profound discussion that danced us through the ballet and the hiding and revealing of black flesh, the unveiling of revelation, and the strategic masquerade of Ruby Hurley as a form of protest and challenge. And it also dipped us into the liminal sea to taste the salt of black sailors. Today, we will hear from a different group of scholars who will continue to play with the concept of masquerade. To let you know how the session is going to proceed, um, from now, um, uh, each panelist is going to give about a 15 minute response, or um, actually, they're gonna introduce themselves um, and then give about a 15 minute response to the exhibit and Dr. Wimbush's uh, keynote address from yesterday. Um, and then uh, the panelists will have a, a time to exchange uh, together. There'll be a musical interlude uh, between 10.25 and 10.30. Uh, please do not uh, close your browser during that time, you know, leave it open. Uh, but we, of course, invite you to walk around the room a little bit, get some tea, get some coffee, um, and please listen to the music um, and interrelate the music um, with what we've been hearing. From about 10.30 to 11.15, uh, I will curate questions from the audience, um, which you can place in the Q&A function. Um, if you take a look at the chat area, you'll see the Q&A. You can put questions in there at any point. I'll be monitoring that Q&A. Uh, so please feel free to put that there, um, and then I will uh, bring those questions up. At this point, um, I'd like to have 10 minutes of exchange between, uh, between you all and the panelists. Um, I have questions, but um, I thought we'd kick the ball to you all. What uh, questions or curiosities, what was sparked? Yeah, this was all really rich. Um, I so am um, honored to be on this panel. It, I've had several questions. Um, one is for um, Miles, just about um, the, the, the work when you talk about um, performing um, when you talk about um, becoming racialized to these kinds of material markings, it really made me wonder about um, the limits of that, like the, limit, the limits of that as, as, um, elasticity um, and whether or not it's performing race or becoming racialized because there's the performance of race. Like when I think of this contemporary moment, I think of the ways in which people can perform a kind of blackness, right? Whether through locks 
or through wearing gold chains. I, you know, this Halloween, I saw this, this guy was dressed up as quote unquote gangster grandpa, a white guy with a hat backwards and the big gold chain. And so there's this performative nature of a kind of a centralized stereotypical blackness. And I wondered like the difference between that kind of performativity and what you're talking about as a kind of becoming racialized through material culture. Um, and, and then I just wanted um, Cecile to say so much more about the, like the sociologist and racialization in France because it so resonated with these kind of early scholars in the US sociological assumptions about assimilating Blacks assimilating into American culture and kind of in, in some ways erasing race um, as central to that project in France. So, oh. um, I'll answer first, but only because I was asked first. Um, and um, I want to say two uh, quick things in response to that great question. Um, one, I don't think of elasticity as a positive. Um, I actually think that elasticity, I'm, I'm really speaking back to people who are claiming that race only exists as rigid and that, that if the system is fluid, it's not racial. Um, so that's really what I'm arguing is that um, race as a system and as a hierarchy is, is, is and must be elastic um, in order to continue doing its work because if it were, if it were rigid, you could break it very easily. Um, so that's uh, the, the first thing that I would say. Um, and the second thing in terms of um, I, the materiality of it, um, I think that the examples that you gave are, are really great because if race is an accent that one can don at a particular moment and then hide at another, or a wig, or a coat, or paint on stage, you know, each of those has different properties. Um, so a coat is one kind of thing, right? You know, clothing is one kind of thing, but paint uh, on the Renaissance stage becomes this sort of way that Othello suddenly transfers some of his stigma to Desdemona. Um, and that wouldn't be possible with a coat. He'd literally have to take it all the way off and give it to her. Um, so part of what I'm arguing then is that, you know, his blackness and the, the shame uh, associated with that um, then becomes uh, transferred to Desdemona through the paint without him losing any. Um, and so that's very different than blackness as coat or blackness as speech or blackness as whatever. Um, so yeah, thank you again for the question. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks for, for the question and also for Miles' answer. These are so uh, thought-provoking. Um, mine just goes in several different directions at the same time. Um, yes, um, the, the, the the, the dream or utopia of a raising race uh, is definitely central to um, the universal project of, of the French Republic. Um, and also, I think that um, the, the will to center on class rather than race and oppose the two is also one way of escaping the, um, the conversation that needs to be had on, on race in, in French history. It is um, very convenient to lay the blame of enslaving fellow human beings at the feet of the French monarchy so that the French Republic remains virtuous. Uh, to borrow from Joe Feechin's uh, concept of white virtue, which I think resonates very much with many of the things that Wimbush uh, explained in his lecture. Um, it also reminds me of um, the, uh, the internationalist socialist dream of uh, breaking barriers among the proletarians of the world, which worked in, in many ways in 19th uh, century French history um, to assimilate um, categories of ethnic white, uh, which much as in the United States were now considered as assimilable as, as, as nicely as they now seem uh, to be when you doctor the, the history of the country, such as the Poles or the Italians, who were very much racialized uh, in frontier settings uh, in France, either close to Italy or, or close to, to Germany. So this makes me often circle back to uh, Senator uh, John C. Calhoun's speech um, in front of the Senate in February 1837, when he argued for a ban on discussion of any abolitionist petitions, which came to be known as the gag rule, um, saying that abolitionists were here to essentially um, foster a civil war in the United States and, and we're hating the, the, um, 
the, the, the United States as it was. We very much have echoes of this. And it strikes me as I study the text over and over again with my students to have him brag about the slaveholding system in the South as precluding any type of class warfare, contrary to what Northern states in the US uh, were grappling with and contrary to what um, the UK or, or France had to grapple with um, in their industrial struggles with the workers. Um, in, in many ways, um, this language of, of class warfare is again, shoved down the throats of black French people who are, uh, who are supposed and expected to uh, frame themselves in terms of class only because this, this concept of race is so upsetting of the categories of Frenchness. And so this is why I, I think that um, it's necessary to read together Franz Fanon, uh, who delves so deep into this matter of internalizing whiteness and, and having this two-ness, this double consciousness that Du Bois explains so articulately uh, at the beginning of, of the 20th century, and also um, to have the, the straightforwardness of Albert Memmi, who said, well, yes, pr white privilege does exist when you're French. It just takes going to the colonies and and ignoring deliberately the, the misery and the exploitation and the deprivation of the people who are colonial subjects. Thank you. Miles, go ahead. I have a question for Shay, if I may. Um, I just found that presentation so powerful. Uh, I, I really um, will be remembering the four R's uh, that you that you ended with. Um, but I want to ask a question that's sort of a disciplinary question. Um, at an early moment, you described race um, as an idea. Um, and I guess perhaps because I'm in performance, you know, I get um, anxious about that. And I, I actually have been concerned, uh, not so much with you, because I saw where you took it, but I've been concerned with the sort of rise of Kendi um, and this sort of history of racist ideas um, and that it's something that's, you know, just a sort of set of misconceptions or bad ideas that can be, that one can be argued out of, do you know what I mean? Sort of through the deliberative process. Um, and I'm wondering, um, as a philosopher who does deal with ideas, um, how you, um, how you would respond uh, to, you know, race as a, as a history, you know, the, to that method of race in the history of ideas, uh, because I do find that you have a more materialist um, turn uh, that you take, but can, can you talk a little bit ab ab about that uh, within philosophy, um, race as material versus race as ideal? Right. Um, so I, I'm thinking maybe the idea because of, of a disciplinary difference is that the, the, meaning of idea that I'm using it is probably somewhat different than the general understanding of of idea. So um, looking at the modernity emergence, right? And if you're looking at, right, so, so race is a social construct. So how something becomes socially constructed is through discursive practices. But at the beginning of a social construction process, you have to have the introduction of concepts and ideas themselves, right? So you have to have a narrative. There has to be a picture that's painted, right? So as, as colonization was occurring, you had all of the philosophers painting pictures of colonized people as a certain sort of trope right? There were certain kinds of attributions that people in your, like people who had never left their neighborhood, as it were, were being told that certain kinds of people over there, they looked a certain kind of way, right? Black is not a color, but they were black or they were red or, you know, they were savages in different kinds of ways, right? So, race was created by a series of descriptive assignations to paint a narrative of kinds of people that didn't, they didn't exist before, right? The, like, the Native American, right, as conceived did not exist until the picture 
of a Native America was socially constructed and then it was taken up as an ideology as a means to justify colonization, right? Previous to that, you just had folks as part of tribes or nations, right? Um, they wouldn't have conceived of themselves as a whole. They wouldn't have conceived of themselves as having this sort of like pan identity. They wouldn't have conceived of themselves as having pan social political practices, right? So the idea, so every kind of social construction starts with somebody telling the story, right? And all stories are founded on inventions, create, creative inventions, good or bad, right? So people are told a story and then people believe the story. And it's through the believing and the enculturation of stories and narratives that material, like ontological realness becomes a thing, right? So the same, same thing works for gender, the same thing works for like settler, settler colonial differentiations, um, like, you know, colonial subject, like those kinds of things are all social constructions that had to start with a narrative. So within the metaphysics of race, and now it's kind of pretty much accepted that what started out as a story, as a creation of a picture of a kind of person that then got attributed to kinds of peoples that were um, assimilative, right, now has become, not not now, but at a certain stage, right, shortly following the introduction of the narrative became real, right? So they were treated as a whole. They were regarded as a whole and then their experiences as a whole created things like medical problems and that, that derive from being exposed to toxic environments all the time, right? So like all of these things over time that come from material um, conditions of oppression and deprivation and all those kinds of things, created literal material realness to something that was previously just um an ideology right so so like if you if you interact with philosophers of science on race they go through the new genetic and biological um specificities that are associated with race that have developed over time because of the social construction of the ideology related to race. So there's there's never an uh, there's there's no possible way now or even 100 years ago or even maybe even 200 years ago where anybody could argue themselves out of the existence of race. Once it became implanted and once it became regarded as a really good idea for certain kinds of purposes, it was permanent. You can't convince somebody like even now for people who are like, yes, race is, race is a social construction. There is never going to be somebody who turns around and says, and then we can eliminate it. Right. It's 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 so material at this point. There is no there is no exit from it, which is a lot of reason why social political philosophers have, especially since like like there was the time previously with like the, in, you know, the introduction of liberal theories, of like John Rawls and all of that, right, where they were really into like this multicultural, you know, cosmopolitan, you know, pluralist kind of thing. And then there was this move towards recognition politics. And then, and then that was just like an attempt to reconcile the historical development from ideology to materiality and then recognizing that the materiality is so entrenched that to go towards a recognition politics is <laughs> is it makes no sense in light of the fact that there's no negotiation left for the materiality right so people it, it sort of works for the same way with like decolonizing like there is no such thing as is decolonizing people are using it as you know as a as a puff piece kind of word that nobody's giving up anything or the idea of indigenizing right they're they're they are themselves performances things like recognition things like um eliminativist theories things like decolonization these are all kinds of attempts to intercept materiality in a way that's not possible.
so if if I can just make one yeah. little thing in response, uh, I think um, while you were talking, two things came to me. And one is just that um, I think that you and I have a different understanding of, of the term ideology. And I think that that's yeah. where the, the rub is. Um, and so um, for me, in a kind of Althusserian mode uh, around I ideology, um, ideology is something that's actually ritualized and that doesn't necessarily have to be articulated um, because I think in some cases the idea um, can be derived from the social practices, right? Um, and I would also say that the social practices are a medium that sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, allow the, the bacteria, <laughs> you know, the, the virus sure. uh, to grow. Um, and so for me, it's- That's very accurate. Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, the social practices uh, from the ideology, uh, which I, you know, so um, in any case, I think for me, that's the the um, difference. But everything other than that, every, everything other than your use of the term ideology, um, I am totally on board with. I think I think maybe the short the shortest way, because philosophers love to talk, is to say that my from the social construction perspective is that idea was explicit that turned into an ideology of discursive practices that were also explicit, that then turned into implicit. So once it got embedded in the institutions and the social practices and the social rituals and the performances, like the ideology is no longer articulate. It is just a mode of, of prescribed behavior. All right, um, so we have a question here um, this is from uh, William Russell, uh, and he's saying that as a historian of theology, he wanted to apply the insights and methodology to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century um, and relating some of these ideas uh, with particular reference to Martin Luther. Um, I think that that is an open question to anyone. Um, so if anyone wants to kind of take that on. Well, I, I have one thought um, that, that's not my specialty, but um, I think I've learned from Dr. Wimbush um, that uh, to the extent that the Protestant Reformation um, was about wresting power from a particular uh, hierarchy of Catholic clerics and redistributing that power downward, and one of the methods uh, was the vernacular translation of the Bible, uh, I think we can kind of see a parallel between that um, redistribution um, of sort of epistemological authority. And what I think um, is, uh, at least according to some social historians, a redistribution of power uh, from the aristocracy to the public um, that is really kind of the white social contract, right? You know, like whether it's that, that's in the US or France, you know, you have a set of privileges um, or in the case of you know, the, Ref, uh, the Reformation uh, skills, you know, Latin, Latin literacy um, that are then sort of broken apart and redistributed uh, downward. Uh, and I think that that's uh, how the two um, might correspond. Marla, did you have something that you wanted to add to that? <laughs> You know what? I was I was literally thinking about everything that Miles just said. Um, I didn't necessarily have because it's an unformed thought, but I I, I thought what I thought where Miles was gonna go was somewhere between the translation of the Bible down to these masses and the work of um, missionizing in these um, black and native populations and what that then does to those communities. It's like a, a difference between the Protestant Reformation, if you will, of the 16th century and this later Protestant <laughs> Reformation, Protestant, um, this, this later um, uh, uh, evangelistic effort in the, in, the, in the 18th century in the U.S. Um, particularly. And what then what versions of the Bible, what interpretations of the Bible are given to the people there and, and the forms of power that are created during the Protestant Reformation um, versus say the first and second great awakenings. So that's. Um, 
So one of the and the idea that one was to and I'm sorry and the idea that one was to empowerment and it seemed like another one was to disempowerment but also to empowerment because you know to teach enslaved people to read was certainly a crime um, but then it creates a different kind of of, of modern subject so anyhow yeah it's, well it's an and to piggyback, question. to piggyback on that I mean and then you get people um, if I've got my history right. Um, like Equiano, like, or maybe it was Cucuano, like actually advocating for, you know, these sort of Black Atlantic Creoles who did, who had been, you know, baptized um, to basically kind of be the vanguard of um, Christianizing unconverted Africans, right? So you're very right. right. It does, like, it, it's both disempowering at a collective level, but it, it, it sort of, creates, uh, and to go to Cecile's point, it almost creates the first class of token Negroes. <laughs> mm. um, we can wait for more questions in the Q&A, but uh, in, in the meantime, I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask a question um, and put um, Dr. Welch and Dr. Frederick in dialogue together uh, because I was thinking that Casalo seems to represent in some ways the four stages of scripturaletics um, that Shay was talking about. Um, but I'd also like to borrow the language of fluidity um, from Dr. Greer um, because the, the way that um, you're describing the four stages of scripturaletics appears very linear. Um, but I was thinking about it as fluid um, and that people, whether in the modern or the ancient or the pre-modern, like at any point in time, um, they find themselves internalizing, uh, perhaps internalizing on purpose and then code switching um, in other spaces where uh, they might not be, uh, they see the ill fit um, and then other spaces in which they can resignify. Um, and so, uh, and it all depends on the spaces in which they find themselves within that they might shift in and out of those scripture letics. Um, and in terms of Casalo, I'm thinking of the passage uh, that Marla read <clears throat> in which in many ways he takes on the mask. Um, he internalizes the idea of, you know, the poor Africans uh, who, you know, didn't, didn't know that God has a, a son, but he also recognizes that this mask is ill fit um, and, he cries tears of demystification within that, even while at the same time accepting the mask that's being placed upon him. Um, and who knows the values that he constructed for himself in those moments of solitude, of anger or resignment, um, you know? And so anyway, I was wondering if, if either or both of you might be willing to talk about how these stages of scripture letics aren't exactly linear, but get circular and dialogical depending on different places that people find themselves. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, there we go. I, I know when Shay talked about the fourth stage of a, as a stage of, of surprising and the survival of folks, it made me certainly think of Casalo and the fact that not only does he adopt, you know, the, 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 the scriptures as taught him, but he also, you know, creates a whole family in the Americas, one that he weeps for, a family that becomes a part and part of this um, plantation life, but then he's also always not fully present there because he's always still longing for um, his home in Africa and hoping that someone will identify him. Will some someone will actually take him back there? And so survival is like in this this in between space between the Americas and between Africa. Oh, yeah. So I guess, um, I mean, that's absolutely right, right? So the, I'm thinking very much of a Hegelian dialectics, which is how I was interpreting the scriptural lectics, right? So the constant back and forth of 
of discursive practices, right? Um, which, as Miles says, requires fluidity, right? So idea, where we may have different uses of the term, ideology is what frames, ideology is, is the scripture. Ideology is what scripturalizes. But ideologies are flexible and they have to be flexible because that is, because every time a contradiction arises, you have to find a new way to like intercept it with some kind of like nonsense, right? Which means that you're constantly like nonsensically altering the boundaries and the borders and like how it interacts with other kinds of, of phenomena that contain it and, and move it forward, propel it. Right. Um, so this, this is what I have. So this is what I'm, I'm conceiving of in terms of the scriptural lectics, but what you're also talking about is an individual, um, phenomenon, right? So it is true within a, it's not nonlinear, but it's not perfectly linear within a sort of progressive, um, transformation of, of stages of modernity, um, individuals always are taking that way of existence up differently. There are going to be people who are recognizing things that others cannot. And when they try to speak to this, they are silenced or regarded as crazy, right? Then they turn back around and then they self-loathe. Um, they do know their code switching, but they don't understand what code switching means, right? So there's these these assigned roles and expectations for individuals are performed differently from individual to individual and given some sort of social situatedness or phenomenological experience will give will cause people to have different relationships to their ascribed identities. And so this just this just is what it what it means to have these other conferred identities right so you might have you might have more of a fixed sense of self but not be able to make sense of it in terms of how others are ascribing expectations to you based on a, a ill ill constructed right and loose category so so what you're thinking is is absolutely right, at least from from the way I'm understanding things. Um, another another point that I wanted to be able to bring up, um, kind of looks at um, Dr. Koke Makoko's work and also Dr. Greer's work. One of the things that both of you uh, brought to the panel is expanding. Um, scripture letics uh, by time for Dr. Greer, you go all the way back to the Roman world, um, and which I think is great as someone who was uh, an ancient historian and, and then found themselves in American studies in the 1940s is very weird transition. Um, and then also, uh, Cecile, you took us to uh, spatially expanding those boundaries away from the US um, and into France, um, into a, a different form of nationalism. Um, and I think that that's actually one place where this conversation hasn't been going as um, as quickly as it as it could. Um, that it kind of stays within the borders of the U.S. as if those things are not fluid um, and haven't been changing. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about um, what it what it does for us to expand our views, either spatially or. Um, I guess spaces in time and also spaces in place. Uh, what does it do for us to be thinking about that um, in a really deep way? And is it helpful to put that in dialogue with the US or is it better to have those conversations kind of on their, uh, literally on their own turf? Um, I, I guess that um, the transatlantic slave trade doesn't really leave us uh, with any choice, but to make these conversations global. Uh, as has just been explained, um, European travelers invented the Native American. And um, we, we have to, to take into account these constructions of whiteness that came along with the constructions of, of otherness, of racialized otherness. Um, it's um, particularly striking to young French students to read Montaigne 
today and discover critical re race theory on Native Americans under the pen of this French aristocrat who was um, essentially locked up in his room trying to think about the, the changing world and and the, the vanishing world also uh, that was being um, shown and unfurled in front of his very eyes and trying to reach out to, to other um, forms of knowledge before they disappeared. So we already have the, the trope of the vanishing Indian uh, when, when he tries to, to talk to the Brazilian interpreter. Well, well, I call him Brazilian because that's where he came from if we take it from, from present day geographical terms, uh, but the Native American sage. Um, and, and so I feel it's, it's always necessary to rediscover oneself in the eye of the other. Uh, maybe that could be connected with universal priesthood uh, to answer the, uh, the, the, the specialist of Lutheran theology. Um, in, in very many ways, um, black French people discover themselves as French people when they move out uh, of the country and, and go to other places where the colonial baggage is not so heavy and where they can be embraced in their Frenchness and where they can feel European while being black. And the same thing works in the other direction what, with African Americans um, finding themselves Americans with no questions asked. Um, so it, it is this fluidity in, in space and the rereading of thinkers in other periods, people grappling with other understandings of what it means to be a slave, what it means to be a free person, uh, what it means to be a man or a woman or a queer person or someone who doesn't want to define themselves in, in binary terms or someone who's in between colonial status and colonizer status and moving into the, the colonialist ethics, as, as Mimi was explaining. Do you, how far do you really want to embrace the other point of view? Um, while being white, how far can you embrace the, the lived realities of the colonized and, and their, their degradation? And these questions um, at the same time are very situated and keep constantly posing themselves again and again. Um, so it's impossible to, to lock these questions up, um, even though we are definitely in a period when, where, where entire groups of people have to be uh, told to, to stay at home, to be confined, and, and not to reach out of their own boundaries, even when their lives are, are imperiled. I should have gone first and not let you, <laughs> that, that's very hard to follow. Um, but I, I, I will say um, one of the things that I'd like to just pick up on uh, there is um, I think one of the things we're dealing with and your presentation was so good in showing it um, is that any attempt to localize the problem to um, export it beyond the borders. Oh, this is American style thinking being imported to France, right? You know, um, in my discipline of early modern studies, it's, ah, uh, you all are bringing modern ideas of race into early modernity, you know, um, these sort of barricades. Um, to my mind, what we really have to start thinking about um, very hard is what is the desire on the part of the scholar or layperson to erect those barricades and to maintain them? You know, is it about making sure that that racism is understood as solely a, U, a phenomenon? I was going to say a U.S. phenomenon, but not even that. A phenomenon of the U.S. South in the 19th century, you know, like just sort of only one image of slavery in that when it was just sort of localized in that one moment. Um, and that's part of why um, I and many others, you know, are, are trying to sort of um, think about um the about Atlantic slavery not as an origin point, um, but as a transfer as a transformation of a system that was already in place. Um, and so that's why I was sort of trying to say it's really that the British and the French and these other European populations who had been enslaved in um, the Roman context um, are transferring that stigma. Um, and that so therefore blackface theater tattoos branding all of these become material practices that um signify the new regime you know the new order but not you know this is the first time we've had stigma or this is the first time we've had you know but just that this is a re um, um which to me then says that the stakes here um 
are about the entire history of the West and about whether or not the West is a sort of self-reforming. I mean, you know, like that's the Democratic Party in the U.S. that, you know, it takes the U.S. a long time, but we always get better. You know, it's like, well, why does it take so long? You know, right? <laughs> you know? Um, and and, and I, I think that's part of why this sort of global and, you know, uh, period jumping kind of thing has to, you know, has to happen because um, the the, you know, sort of moral justification of the Western project um, is based on trying to minimize and localize the problem and sort of say, well, it's not Greece, it's not Rome, it's not here, you know. Um, and so I'm just very suspicious of, of any move, whether it be geographic or temporal, uh, to say it's over there, because I, I, as I think uh, Cecile's pro, uh, uh, presentation showed so well, that's always about trying to conceal you know, yes, it may be true that U.S. racism and French racism are not the same, but that doesn't mean that racism as an entire topic belongs to the U.S. and not to France. Um, Dr. Wimbush came on. Would you like the floor? Um, yeah, I wonder, I, you, you know, it may be that um, this panel is has so intimidated others that they are loath to jump in. I, I guess I'm not there yet. Uh, fascinating uh, discussion. I have a couple of questions or issues uh, my own, and I would love this opportunity to get some feedback from you. Let me um, maybe mention all of them up front. Let's see how far. Rachel, you. Uh, um, stop us uh, at an appropriate time. Um, I appreciated very much the um, exchange about, um, well, I think uh, Shay set this up with um, uh, her own um, uh, interpretation of what I'm playing with, um, with scriptural lectics. And um, that's really helped quite a bit. Um, the exchange, I think, that was had between Miles and Shay, the difference between the, um, maybe the, the rigid or the fixed and the elastic, uh, it seems to me that that goes to the heart of the question about whether and to what extent uh, using script, scriptures, scripturalizing, lectics, and so forth, it's where I've been playing for the last several years, um, is helpful, works, um, and is conducive to more expansive uh, analytics. For example, I think, um, this is probably one of the more compelling um, ways to describe and analyze uh, what Miles just referred to uh, as the modern Western. Uh, I think it goes beyond the West, but certainly the modern Western uh, project. That is, it is a scriptural phenomenon. Uh, given the way in which um, uh, we uh, here, for the sake of argument, would understand uh, the scriptural. So I actually want to hear a little bit more from one or two of you about the, about whether and the extent to which uh, analyzing the modern, the complexity of social relations and the modern, um, with all the power uh, relations that are that appertain, uh, uh, whether scriptures, the scriptural uh, works, um, that that would be very helpful. Um, when uh, I think of what I share with um, in training with uh, a few other fields, um, maybe some overlap with philosophy, but basically. Uh, any of the uh, textual, you know, philological oriented uh, fields. I, I guess I think first about uh, classics. Um, 
here's the rub that we won't get very far um, in, in fact, fathoming, unearthing what is at issue, uh, how power works, unless we explode those fields. And that's part of the logic behind my wanting always to push the necessity of problematizing the scriptural, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, the School of Theology is certainly built around it. Uh, all literature programs are built around it and, and, and so on. It's very powerful the extent to which uh, colleges, whether colonial uh, or 1950s versions, uh, they've been built uh, around that kind of ideology. Uh, second, um, the, just the notion of passing, um, which I pick up from Morrison, which um, it struck me, uh, helped me to understand uh, what one could do with uh, what she provokes uh, around um, passing on or not passing on a story, a kind of haunting story. Uh, and I think um, from my point of view, that's where Equiano is left. I wonder if any of you see uh, any um, uh, more theoretical, analytical possibilities um, in, in all of that. Um, and that forced me to go back to read uh, the likes of Nella Larson, uh, the uh, documentary film that I think is out or nearly out based on her book. Uh, we might be able to relate all of this uh, uh, to uh, the figures we've been talking about. Uh, thirdly, I don't know if we'll have time to address any all of this, um, but the notion of the, the audience or the readers for whom was Equiano uh, performing is identity performances, some controversy around this to be sure. Uh, I am in agreement with the likes of um, another Vincent uh, here, Coretta and others uh, about uh, Equiano here, uh, not performing race in that sort of basic narrow sense in which um, we hunger to make him uh, one of our own and need him to be uh, what we think uh, we are or can become, um, but that he probably was not writing uh, for many of the interests that we now take for granted, uh, but uh, for others. For example, you can flatten it and see it as sort of, uh, you know, uh, friends, abolitionists of, um, of, uh, of many different stripes. Uh, anyway, I want to put that, these on the on the table for consideration. Don't know how far we can get with those, but uh, I would be pleased to um, uh, pick uh, your brains about uh, any of these matters. Just to let you know, we're going to go till about ten thirty, um, give or take. Uh, so yeah, please get us started. Now you've already intimidated everybody else. Now come on, now you can't can't possibly not want to speak now. <laughs> I have one remark about the scriptural um, that is brief. Yeah, um, I I think um, before you went back to the scriptural, you you actually use script as the you know um, as as one um, sort of uh, root term, um, and I think. Uh, I think that's why I like to focus uh, on um, theater because uh, not because of the script that the actors follow, um, but actually because uh, in early modernity, uh, there are a lot of books on stage, you know, and there are a lot of moments in which um, characters are forced, well, either choose to read or are forced uh, to read. And they reveal something about themselves in the way that they read or fail to do so. Um, now, this is a time, you know, I'm talking late 16th century, uh, early 17th century London, uh, where not all of the audience would themselves have had literacy. 
of the official, you know, print alphabetic literacy kind. Um, but I would argue uh, alongside, uh, you know, the way you frame it in White Men's Magic, um, that they were nevertheless in watching other people fail to read, yeah. um, arrogating to themselves a status as um, uh, epistemological authorities. Um, and so um, the, the script, uh, and this is why, you know, I think you're so right to emphasize getting out of the discipline, right? Uh, the script uh, can never be understood only to be manuscript, printed text, you know, et cetera. It is the whole of social reality. Um, and, and it's only when we, when we wrench the book, whether it be the Bible <laughs> or the encyclopedia or whatever, out of its kind of intellectual context and back into social life in the way that it happens, you know, within the theater, that we start to see that epistemological authority um, rests on a lot of different, um, doesn't require knowledge of the book. Um, that's only sort of one of the avenues through which it might um, assert itself. Um, and so that's why this broader view of the scriptural um, has been so helpful uh, to me. Good. Well, I just wanted to pick up your on your comment about audience because it's something I thought about quite a bit um, in writing uh, the piece for today um, because uh, for Casalo and Zorno Hurston, there is this audience. And the question at the moment when Hurston is writing is with her um, uh, sponsor, Charlotte Mason, they're wondering what, whether or not black people have fallen out of vogue, right? Like the writing, the interest in black people has fallen out of vogue because, you know, this movement, the abolitionist movement, et cetera, this moment early on, um, and the and the black arts movement, you have a deep interest in black people, and they're wondering to what extent. And Hurston is very clear when she's writing to the publishers and they're pushing back. And they want her to take out the di dialect. They want her to use, you know, standard English and for her to tell Casala's story. And she's insistent upon not doing that because they're interested in a particular image of Black people being presented. And she's interested in this, this, this more, I don't know, I, I hate to use the word authentic, but a, a more uh, direct image of what he's presenting being, being used. And so it's not just... The publishing house, but it's like, well, who is the audience, right? And no. so, is it, is it the whites that they're that they would be selling these books to? Is it the black people, the intellectuals who are you now upset because you know they're really pushing for black acceptance into American society, and so they don't really want Zora Neale Hurston to keep publishing these works of these black people with broken dialect and. Mm -hmm. you know, it, these uh, attention to Africa, which has not been, right? we haven't had a, a kind of Black is Beautiful movement, right? A kind of Africa is, is a great movement. And so there is this, this moment where people are resisting Africa and particularly amongst um, a kind of larger Black population. And so it's the, the question of audience, I think, is really is a really important question when we're thinking about what it means to write the modern subject. Um, and then I was so glad you said passing because I've been thinking about passing and Nella Larson yeah. earlier on. I think maybe when Miles was talking, we were talking about elasticity um, because I, I think that's that's really key. Like who gets to pass and, um, you know, people's there's a difference between being willing to pass and being able to pass, right? And, um, you know, I was thinking about C Casala, not that, not even that he's even interested, but he's unable. And, and Hurston is unwilling, right? She's unwilling to, to write these narratives that would yield people towards a kind of uh, Eurocentric passing. She's unwilling to write, scripturalize people in that way, so. Those are the thoughts that I was thinking when you said audience and when you said passing. Thank you so much, everybody. I wanted to invite um, 
Dr. Velma Love uh, to turn her camera on um, to be able to uh, give some summarizing comments uh, over the past uh, two day exhibition so far. I have a few notes that I want to share. Um, I think this has been fascinating, actually. This symposium and exhibit has been magical. The music, images, narrative, discourse, philosophical reflections have woven together a beautiful tapestry that will certainly nurture our scholarship, our teaching, our thinking in new and exciting ways. Many thanks to Dr. Wimbush for his vision and to the Pitts Library staff who collaborated with him to make this vision a reality. Uh, and thanks to your selection of the panelists. I mean, that was magic in and of itself. Uh, a special thanks to the members of the panel that I worked with on yesterday, uh, Kimberly Jordan for her images of the black body and dance, Jacqueline Hidalgo for her direction to uh, the uh, concepts of the apocalypse and masking and unveiling, uh, Carolyn Medine to directing attention to liminality and the sea and rites of passage and ancestors and and Rosetta Ross for, for her intriguing concept of uncoupling salvation from Christianity. So I've just named a few highlights that registered with me. And yesterday I shared a, uh, a brief uh, story about Eshu, the, the God of the crossroads in the Yoruba philosophy, the divine messenger. And in the story, Eshu allowed uh, enslavement to happen because in spite of, uh, of the great sacrifice of life and, and, and brutality, uh, he saw it as a way of spreading black bodies and black genius across the world and changing the face of humanity. And I, I, I wanted to just add part two of that story. And, and that is that when these black bodies arrived in these various locations and those who had survived the unthinkable horrors of the Middle Passage. When they arrived on land, they, in these various locations, all they had was their bodies, their bodies. And they unpacked themselves. They unpacked themselves as Candomblé in Brazil. They unpacked themselves as Lokumi in Cuba. They unpacked themselves as Shango Baptist in Trinidad and Vodun in Haiti. And in the Southeastern United States, they unpacked themselves as hoodoo, conjuration and root work under the cover of night and beneath the mask of the Holy Spirit and the sanctified church. They created out of their bodies, scripturalizing activities I want to suggest that this exhibit and this symposium conceived in the imagination of Vincent Wimbush is in effect an unpacking of the black body, consciousness and imagination with implications that go far beyond the concept of blackness. And I want to close with an invitation to us that comes from Natasha Marin uh, in this little book, The Black Imagination. So this entry was written by Reagan Jackson. And it's an invitation to listen. First, I listen. This is hard when my feelings are screaming, when my body, my heart, the pieces of me are aching. Sometimes it's easier to talk, to pray, to complain, to beg, to demand. I do these things too. But then I listen and I follow. There is a guiding star that talks to me. I don't know her name or even her language. 
mostly she is a dream walker of pictures, sounds, and feelings. And I awake knowing what I'm mine to do. If she asked our unborn child, guardian angel, spirit guide, or interdimensional healing practitioner, I don't know. I just know that when I listen and I follow directions, healing happens. Sometimes there is a ceremony involved. Candles or water, writing letters or burning pictures, the release of song or tears. At these times, I feel most acutely the loss of my cultural traditions. We, the children of the unchosen diaspora, the progeny of the stolen, the kidnapped, the shackled, the tortured, the enslaved, are in many ways still lost. Lost to our heart longings, our language, our indigenous practices, we pray to white Jesus, God of colonizers, and wonder why our prayers aren't answered. With no disrespect to Jesus or Buddha or Allah, or to any of the gods who come around here, but we are the daughters not of Jacob and Abraham, but of Oshun. So long estranged, I can only listen and guess make do with plastic cowrie shells and white fabric, pray in English and hope that there is something beyond my colonized words, that some part of me is still me, enough to be heard and healed anyway. So on that, on that note, I, I, I just say thank you for this incredible uh, incredible uh, event, uh, dialogue, and exchange. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Love, and, and thank you for the incredible reading. Um, uh, so I'm coming on to briefly summarize also um, the panel uh, that we had today. So we looked to, we started with um, Dr. Welch and looking at uh, hyper signification um, of the racialized body and the stages of scriptural letics, taking us through rejection, uh, refusal, resignification. Um, we looked at the um, the language of this type of scriptural, uh, scripturalization with Dr. Koke Mokoko looking between the veil and the mirror of Black modernity in France and the idea of French nationalism and the way in which um, Black flesh had to negotiate within those frameworks, uh, finding a space and place for themselves. Um, Dr. Marla Frederick uh, showed us another example of these types of um, this type of play with masks, uh, looking at Zora Neale Hurston's um, bringing to life uh, Casalo um, in the uh, in uh, at the turn of the century. Um, this uh, dialogue that was not necessarily about black triumph, but a, rather about the possibility of modernities. Um, and finally, Dr. Greer um, took us on a journey back in time, coming all the way forward, looking at the ways in which skin color, as he said, becomes a jerkin, a thing that wraps around and then becomes innate. And the idea of blackness uh, being elastic and taking that jerkin onto other forms in other bodies as well. Um, the discussion over the past two days has been um, playful, enlightening, uh, and profound in many ways. Um, and so again, we wanted to thank um, the ISS and Dr. Wimbush uh, for bringing this exhibition to us um, and also to Emory and Pitt's Theological Library as well. 
at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Wimbush, uh, and then we'll also have another musical in interlude. Okay. All right. We're going to close with the song. I'm just being told. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rachel, Velma, and panelists. Uh, we're nearly out of time, but we must make some final statements uh, together, and we'll see if we can end before the system shuts us down on uh, at least one of the last two songs that we had in mind. Um, Dr. Adams? Well, and for those I haven't met, uh, my name is Bill Adams, and I have the great privilege of uh, serving as the director of Pitt's Theology Library, and it's been an incredible honor for us as a library to facilitate what has been stimulating conversations over the last two days, has been an amazing exhibition that we're excited will persist in time uh, through the magic of the internet. Um, and so I wanna thank all those who have participated both as panelists, as moderators, but also as audience members. Um, I invite you to enjoy the exhibition, to study the exhibition, and indeed to learn from the exhibition. It has been quite an amazing experience to work with Dr. Wimbush. Um, and as I said yesterday, this to me is, is how libraries should work. Um, as Dr. Wimbush uh, appropriately uh, critiqued, we're often in the business of displaying things, uh, but we don't thoughtfully think about how we can use those displays to bring people together and to foster conversation. Um, two days of intense conversations has been a small glimmer of, of, of what can be for libraries. And so I'm very excited to continue this conversation, uh, but also to use this as a model uh, to invite other conversations around the table here at a library. Um, my deepest thanks to uh, those at, on my staff here who have worked so hard to make this happen through digitization, through metadata, um, and then of course, most of all, to our great colleague, Jamie Bostic, who has been behind the scenes running all of this today. So J Jamie, thank you so much uh, for, for making all of this happen. Uh, Dr. Wimbush, I just wanna close with a word of thanks from you um, and to invite all of you to see this as an ongoing conversation because we're excited to keep the work going. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all again for your participation. I was deeply honored uh, that you accepted the invitation to uh, join us to be part of this uh, event. Um, those of you who served on the panel, we will be in touch uh, with you about um, uh, the next steps we will take in continuing the conversation and to disseminate some of uh, our thinking to a uh, broader audience. Uh, to all, please visit uh, the exhibition and be in touch with us uh, about uh, your ideas for continuing uh, this sort of work. Uh, we'll end with um, this uh, one selection, uh, Glory to God, uh, signifying on um, uh, part of Handel's Messiah. Thank you all very much. Stay well.